Welcome back to coverage here at GP Phoenix. I'm Marshall Sutcliffe. I'm in the booth with Eduardo Sajkalik, and we are ready for round number five here on day one. Jacob Nagro, he is playing Eldrazi Tron, 4-0. John Stern. On the other side of the table is on Mono Green Tron. Now, Eduardo, both of these decks have the word Tron in them because they take advantage of those Urza's lands that we like to talk about. We just call them Tron for short. But they actually have a significantly different game plan when it comes to what to do with all that mana. Right. Um, and <laughs> it does look like a mirror, to be fair. Uh, very yes. similar lands, very uh, similar turn one plays. Actually identical turn one plays. Uh, nah. Two power plants. Always have to reread these lands because there's so yeah. many different arts. They're, uh, they're both power plants. So. It's, it's probably a good advice at home if you're playing against Tron. Just always read what the land names are <laughs> just to sure. be safe. But yeah, um, we'll see a departure here. Though here's a forest yeah. from from John. Yeah, the the main thing though that you'll see is it's mu John's plan to make Tron is much more consistent. John plays more copies of cards that allow him to get lands. John plays, for example, the Sylvan Scrine, which will not be in Jacob's list because Jacob plays no addition, no colors. It's a colorless deck entirely, um, and essentially. Jacob is using the power of Tron plus Eldrazi Temple to power out frets and kind of act as a mid-range deck. And Tron tends to prey on mid-range decks. So, as in mono green Tron. Because it's essentially trying to get to its plan. It consistently, very consistently gets Tron on turn 4. Turn 3, not that much, but it's almost always turn 4. Mm -hmm. And once John can land a powerful fret, uh, a Karn, an Ugin, and Ulamog, that's when he can start running away with the game. Um... Here, it's really Jacob has to put as much pressure as quickly as possible. And this Eldrazi, te natural Eldrazi Temple helps that a lot. Yeah, so he does get to play a Mata Reshaper here after that turn one expedition map, and he is going to start attacking right away. But as you said, we can see clear, clear straight away, there's already two pieces represented for John, just with the map and his board, let alone his mind that he's going to play here. So now he has Tron lined up as long as he wants to spend the mana to crack that expedition map. And that's assuming he doesn't just have it in his hand already. Yeah, I mean, John's just setting up at this point and waiting to untap into a big fret. One, one of the hardest cards for Jacob to deal with be, is going to be Wormcoil Engine. Usually the Eldrazi Tron decks tend to play like maybe two Karns. They tend to play two All is Dust and two Karn as their kind of top end. Mm -hmm. And sometimes a Nulamog because you can Which is, by it. the way, the bottom end on the mono green deck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Karn is where things start. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, um, and, and basically Worm Coil Engine buys John so much time that it allows him his much more powerful game plan to enact. But you can see here that Ghost Quarter I was mentioning. Jacob knows that essentially this Ghost Quarter is his only way to interact with John. So this is what I was discussing, having a fret plus trying to tempo a Ghost Quarter. The main issue is that Jacob's fret is only dealing free damage a turn, and he can only deal with one of John's Tron lands per turn. If Jacob was on the play and had a Fought Knots here, this would be way more effective. But because he's basically playing catch-up, and that's not the position he wants to be in. All right, well, John Stern all lined up with uh, the Urza's Tower now to join the mine and the power plant. Tower's in hand. Yeah, but so uh, he's going to have a window... <clears throat> to draw another piece or to use his expedition map. Right now, we're in the draw step, I believe, and yeah. Jacob Nagra has used his uh, ghost quarter. Yeah, good spot. So essentially, the reason you want a ghost quarter and draw step, the mono green, the Tron lists usually play a very small number of basics. The mono green actually runs more. So uh, John's running a full five forest. Wow. So, so unless his hand is really like all the forests. He's, the Ghost Quarter is usually not going to give that option. But that's why it's usually correct to wait until the draw step um, is so that sometimes you strand a basic. That so, said, you, so what you're saying you know, is he could have, let's say he only had two forests, he could have drawn one here, then Ghost Quarter couldn't, couldn't find anything. If John was playing the green-black version, this would be true. But because John is on yeah. the mono-green version, this, this isn't quite the case. Right, it's not what's going to happen, but that's why Jacob made the play that he made. Yeah. Um, it was at a cost, though, because it meant that John could use that extra mana into the expedition map, essentially tapping the land, getting an untapped forest. Um, and I'm trying to remember the previous turn, but I believe John was tapped out because Silver Scribe into map. So Jacob would have had more value actually doing it on his turn. Um, but this is, but Jacob doesn't have perfect knowledge of John's list. John could very well be on black green, and that runs way less basics. So, yeah, so John is going to do that. He's going to use the mana from Ex Expedition Map to go search up another mine, play the tower that Jacob already knew about, and once again threaten next turn 
to have, what, nine mana available? Goodness sakes. Yeah, and this is, and John's going to get the first crack at Tron, and that's going to be very powerful. Um, he does have access to, I'm going to say only nine mana. I know that sounds really bad. Yeah, but it's insane. <laughs> right, but if he, ha he actually has, I believe, the Ulamog, the Ceaseless Hunger in hand, if I looked correctly. I think he might also have Ugin. Yes. U Ugin... Not so, not so great. This is not the, the hottest matchup for no. Ugin. It's still great, though, right? Yeah. I, I think here the best line for John is just to use uh, Karn, uh, Stone Rain your opponent, essentially. Uh, I so you're saying Karn minus it, kill a land. Yeah. Then the Mattery Shipper will kill Karn and then get Ulamog and you take over. Okay. I want to know now, what land do you kill? Guaranteed value with the Eldrazi Temple or do you just say, I can't let you get Tron and take a Tron piece out? Um, because of the map in play, you have to take the Tron piece out. Because you know that he's going to yes. have it anyway. Exactly. Okay. Th there is a risk to this play, which is that if Jacob had a, has a Fought Not Seer, which he, um, then John can get like basically lose his Ulamog, and that's sure. a high risk. But Jacob was very incentivized to play Fought Not Seer this turn. Um, Ooh. But yeah, the Worm Coil Engine is kind of like a halfway point. Well, this, not is, this is one that you mentioned earlier that yeah. could be a problem. It, yeah, because it's very hard for Jacob to actually deal with the Worm Coil engine. Um, so that's why it's getting cast. Wow. Like j j he has to just log through it? Yeah, essentially. Um, I'm just going to double check. The, no, the best. You said he's got Karn, right? Well, some of the lists play it, but I don't think Jacob does. His okay. best line is Dismember plus Warping Whale. Oh, my God. I mean, Are it, you serious? Yeah, it's, it's okay. At least it doesn't make some other worms. Oh, sure. Okay, yeah. <laughs> okay, you sold me. It's not the absolute worst case. It's still horrendous, but... Yeah, and Jacob here grabbing the Ghost Quarter, uh, essentially realizing <laughs> that Jacob understands that at four or five mana, he can operate while John doesn't do so well at those mana points. So Jacob is full on trying to disrupt John's Tron uh, because he understands that that's what he needs to do. Uh, I also believe he just has the Tron pieces in hand, so that definitely incentivizes him to get Ghost Quarter. Um, I think here, if you got the Ghost Quarter, you're kind of priced into to running it out. Um, even running something like an, a, a Reality Smasher is not going to be very good in the face of Worm Coil Engine anyways. Um, but Jacob's in a really rough spot here. He doesn't have either of the cards I mentioned as a yeah. possible way to deal yeah, with. He's got Endbringer, I think, in hand. That's not yeah. going to do it. Uh, yeah, Endbringer. Uh, in the, John's got the real Endbringer, the ceaseless <laughs> hunger. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and he d he can cast it next turn with a single land drop of any sort. So Jacob's going to be proactive this time and just Ghost Quarter here on his turn. But John's picking up the library. He's got another forest in there, as you mentioned earlier. Yeah, and if you're playing, if you were playing from Jacob's seat, this is when you would know that John's on mono green Tron. Free basic force <laughs> in the black green version is very rare, so I would instantly put ver Tron um, John on the mono green version, which uh, means that post board I'm not worried about a card like Fotsies, for example. Okay. Uh, although you know it's not really a card I would worry about. It's just I wouldn't play around that effect. Yeah, yeah, you? no. It's just you're you're just taking stock. I mean, this is a best two out of three match. Even if he doesn't end up winning this game, Jacob has got to be looking for edges for games two and three. Yeah. And John still looks like he's in pretty good shape here. Worm Coil Engine, as you mentioned, extremely <laughs> difficult to deal with. And here we go. Big Daddy on the stack. Ulamog, the Ceaseless Hunger. He's got a triggered ability when you cast it. Exile, two permanents. Yeah, let's get rid of this. Uh, I guess Temple and Tron piece is good. You could also get rid of the two Tron pieces, which might be a little better. But like this way, Jacob can't really cast spells. I mean, um, this game's just over, right? It should be, yeah. yeah. Essentially, John will get his two attacks with Ulamog, and there's not much that Jacob can do. He what? has no real main deck answer to this. Um, Ulamog, outside of the wonder, is double dismember. Uh, yeah, and here... Double dismember is kind of hot, actually. I, I like where you're going with that. <laughs> oh, there's all his dust. <laughs> That's not going to do anything. J Jacob is uh, just watched as he drew the card that he is instantly going to sideboard out yes, the Yes, that is the one card that he's like, <laughs> no. <laughs> Those two are out. He could face up, sideboard them out. I think there would be no issues. Definitely. Yeah, this is just over. Yeah, John probably there we said, go. oh, man, really? All this dust? That sucks. <laughs> I, I mean, don't, Jacob could... You don't want that one. Yeah. But, but because of uh, the Mattery Shipper, that brings up an interesting point where John should have... He was like 95-plus percent to win that game. So there is actually a line where he should have taken two Tron pieces because essentially the only way John can really lose is if Jacob miracles a Tron and attacking into Reshaper that turn. So... 
if you attack into Reshaper and there's a Tron piece and then Jacob naturally has the other one, um, then they have Tron and he might have an out. He might be playing a Karn. Not in this case, but he might. So I think in, you know, he's still far behind, but you gave him out. So I think in that case, I would have actually preferred to take both Tron pieces because I don't think the Eldrazi Temple, I think it was a non-issue. Sure. Uh, but yeah. Uh, I The sideboard plan, uh, the Eldrazi Tron deck, uh, this is not the matchup they really want. Um, so basically, Jacob is just going to mulligan aggressively to Chalice of the Void, I would suspect, especially on the play. Um, there's not much that he can board in here. I mean, the All is Dust come out, but then what comes in? And there's not much. I mean, at best, I would actually... Uh, it's like Hanger Backwalker. I mean, that looked horrendous Rel Relic in of game Progenitus, one. the cantrip. It's just... Oh, no. There's just no plan here. You know you've hit rock bottom when you're just bringing in the Relic just because it's better you, than the worst cards you have. You could needle... A ma th these are all... I, I guess the best card you could bring in is like two needles to name Oblivion Stone since that card's really bad for you. Sure. So I'd probably like board out to all I his mean, dust for two needles and then the Warping Wheels are okay. They ramp, they counter a Sylvan Scrine. I think that's where you have to be. Chalice. The, you know, uh, John does play... Multiple planeswalkers too, right? N needle Karn? Yeah, the, the, yeah. So the needle, the needles seem like the best yeah. option, but then it, the, like the options are just terrible. I guess you bring in the basilisk caller um, because you can't really cut the ballistas, and it gives you an out to worm coil engine. Okay, yeah, sure, that's a good way to do it. Yeah, you know the card that I really want to see from Jacob's side here is is thought not seer, right? I want to yeah. see him put that card into play because that gives him a clock plus disruption and you know that game he did have some measure of disruption right you mentioned it he had the ghost quarter he had the ability to to make john stumble a little bit no pressure though he had right. no way to actively pressure john's life total and uh yeah those, the, those stumbles yeah. simply were like okay i'll do this next turn then yeah and that came down a little bit to play draw on the play jacob Definitely. would have been able to get an a smasher potentially and that would have been able to, to be more than enough pressure i think jacob's ideal hand here Chalice on, on one, turn two. Fought not Seer, turn three, and then uh, just dial up the pressure. Um, as for John, uh, he's pretty much going to stay with his game plan. He has a really cool card in Surgical Extraction, so he could take Jacob off Tron by Ghost Quartering one of the lands and then uh, Surgical Extracting it. But I don't think that's that great because... Um, Jacob can get away with like running at four or five mana, Mind Stone, Eldrazi Temple, so... I don't think that's the line you want to take, which basically means that John, he has life from the loan. That's pretty good against uh, this Ghost Quarter plan. It's a little slow, but I really like the free Fought Not Seers and the free Fractus that John can bring in. Those creatures line up well against what Jacob's trying to do. Speed uh, bumps. Speed bumps, they work at like four and five mana as well. Yeah, yeah. So like Ghost Quarter, right, it stops Tron, but it doesn't, d it doesn't prevent getting to four and five and i would probably bring these mid-range threats in because jacob is actively going to get chal try to get chalice actively going to try to ghost quarter and these trade with jacob's threats while buying time to eventually get there because jacob can't stop john from eventually getting there so i think john is going to take it on top of taking game one it's a favorable matchup in his w in his way um to, to kind of board in these like um you know, mid-range frets, the Fault Not Sears and the Fractusk. I would probably see the U the Ugins are obviously terrible. Um, uh, the world the world breaker is fine, so probably keep that. I think I'd take out the free ballistas. They don't really do much in this matchup. I don't like the Ugins, and if you're going to shave another card, I guess you could shave a Karn um, or the Emrakul, the Promised End, uh, since uh, that ca that card is okay, but you don't really need too much top end. Um, it's really cool though. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, John's turned in a really good position here, up a game in a favorable matchup. Jacob is going to have to have things go well for him this game where he's on the play and he has those type of disruption plus threat type draws that can get him the job done. But then he's going to have to do it again on the draw. It's a lot to ask. Yeah, it can be really hard. <laughs> But uh, Jacob has a good shot here. He's really looking for Chalice and John to have kept a hand with many stars, spheres, stirrings. Um, the problem is, like, natural tr Tron land plus map plus uh, Scrying, as John has, is pretty powerful. Although, yeah, it seems like it's Tron land plus map plus Scrying from this angle, but there's not many lands in John's hand. It's mm. probably, as long as there's two, it's more than enough, though. Yeah, he kept it. Jacob starts off with the ideal land in Eldrazi Temple. Yeah, the Eldrazi... This can, this can no. get him extremely powerful starts. 
Right. The Eldrazi, the Tron lands are what allows Jacob to really go fast, but the Eldrazi temples um, kind of work as a, a way to put pressure quicker. So the Tron lands allow Jacob to go over the top. The Eldrazi temples allow Jacob to put pressure quicker. Um, so here, we're going to see a turn three Fought Knots here, most likely, and John's going to expect that. So what John's going to do here is probably uh, try to... If he has a second Tron piece, this is exactly what he wants to do this turn. Um, otherwise, John's probably going to set up for torn, turn four Tron. But Jacob has a little bit of pressure. Even that Walking Ballista is going to deal probably three or four damage, um, even unpumped, while Jacob tries to get there. It really depends on John's hand. He's going to be really redundant. So it's just a question, what are the threats that John can present? And does he have enough of these mid-range uh, Fawn Knot Seers and uh, Frack Tusks to kind of combat Jacob's pressure? Um, and it's worth noting, I like those cards a lot more on the draw than on the play. I think on the <laughs> play, you should just go for your game plan, unless you think your opponent can take you off Tron with something like a Surgical plus Ghost Quarter. You should go for those mid-range threats, especially on the draw. Uh, because they buy you time. But on the, on the play, you should just go with primary game plan. Most likely. That, that's my suspicion. Okay, well, there it is. The Thought Knot's here. And then potentially followed up by more threats coming in the next few turns. There's Endbringers in hand. Multiple for Jacob. So you might have to wait on those a little bit. But in the meantime, he does get the key play here. A turn three Thought Knot's here. And he's going to look at the hand. What are you seeing here, Eduardo? Uh, a very difficult choice. I see because what are you trying to achieve? This member buys time. Oblivion Stone goes over the top. Fractus buys time. Uh, scrying with the map means that Tron is basically going to happen. I think here the Scrying and the Star are pretty much excluded uh, because it's very hard to stop John having tr like the actual Tron in terms of like the lands. So Ghost Quarter will disrupt John, but because John loses a Tron piece. It doesn't really matter which one. He just loses one on the table. So it disrupts him by a turn. So I think the Scrying and Star are like going to be kept. So this member is the biggest tempo play here. Uh, I That's think the short-term gain that he can get. Right. The, the, the Fractus and the Oblivion Stone kind of hit the same note. They basically go a little over the top once John gets enough mana. Uh, so I, kinda, I really like Jacob's line of taking the Dismember here. Um, since that would have been a really powerful tempo play to go Dismember plus Searcher Land. And I really like Jacob's take here. I think that was the right, the right card to take. So what does it look like from John's perspective? He's now had the Dismember taken away by Thought Knots here. So Thought Knots at least going to stick around for a while. John still developing his mana base. But what does the later part of the game look like? Yeah, I, I think later you get like to slam some Beefarinos, some Oblivion, Oblivion Stone, Jacob's Board, or Frack Tusk, all very hard to deal with uh, mid-range frets uh, until you get to uh, basically have fun. Um, <laughs> he, Run rough shot over him. Yeah. Here I'm not 100% uh, sure on the sequence with the Chromatic Star. Um, basically, John knows that Jacob has access to Fought Knots here. So I don't know what John was digging that he would have run over uh, the, the Scrying this turn. Uh, so maybe it was correct for John to go Star Scrying and keep the Star in play and just draw a card later so Jacob would have one less option with Fought Knots here. Mm -hmm. Since I don't know what John would have done that would have been more profitable. I guess, like, d drawing this member would have been the only card. But then you're sure. stopping yourself from Oblivion Stone. So I, I think, like, John shouldn't have cracked the star here. It just gives more information to Jacob. Well, he's going to be able to use that information because Jacob does have the follow-up Thought Knots here. And he sees the three lands there in the middle. But the Oblivion Stone and the Thrag Tusk still in hand for John Stern. Yeah, the, and the, there goes the Oblivion Stone. Yeah, that was a much easier pick. Fract Oblivion Stone Raph yeah. gets rid of everything while... Fractus doesn't. Right. Here's a Ghost Quarter as well. Actually, now that I see the second Ghost Quarter, because with the first Ghost Quarter, that was a harder pick. But with the second Ghost Quarter, I'm, it's actually a lot closer. The thing is, though, that John can easily get to five lands anyways. He can just play Oblivion Stone and then next turn get to five. So, it, so Jacob has to essentially take the Oblivion Stone because John doesn't need eight mana to make it work. He can just go free mana, Oblivion Stone, play my lands. And Jacob can't really Ghost Quarter... John out of five. So here, it's better for uh, Jacob to take the Oblivion Stone because it would have been a problem. Oh my gosh, that's a draw. What did he draw? Oblivion Stone. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, what a rip for John Stern. Yeah, this is a really easy turn for John. Tron piece, stone, go. Oh man, Jacob's going to be unhappy with this turn of events. You know, <laughs> like, I just took that away from you. I mean... And it's back. 
That's true. The The main thing, though, is John's going to take a beating. This is already 9 damage on the board, putting John to 5 without anything else. If J Jacob with another land can make put John down to 4, and then the Ballista's on 2 counters. And then at that point, John has to make a decision because he has to Oblivion Stone during Jacob's attack. But if Jacob can put John down to, say, 2 life, that means that John is under threat from walking Ballista. So how much time John has here is actually pretty interesting. Um, because he wants to crack the stone when Jacob plans to attack, because then he can, then he prevents a reality smasher that turn essentially. Sure. But here, if Jacob goes land pump ballista, um, looks like he didn't have the land this time. Yeah. Then he would have put John down to virtual two, uh, basically four and two damage. However, the fractus skin hands means that he has to be careful about giving John Tron. Although my view is that with 9 mana, it's just one short of going Oblivion Stone plus Fractusk. So, yeah, this is actually pretty tight. The fact that, I mean, Jacob is probably locked into his play since he doesn't have access to another land. Um, he doesn't even use the Ghost Quarter because he realizes that there's no value in preventing uh, John from having Tron this turn. And he'd rather be able to cast a Reality Smasher after the Oblivion Stone. Um, however, if I'm in John's seat here, my play is most likely going to be land go. Um, Jacob can't pop him the Ballista. You don't really mind if Ghost Quarter hits one of your Tron pieces. Um, essentially here because, well, you still have access to five mana. And, yeah, you get to crack the Oblivion Stone. Uh, draw two cards on your turn, two fresh cards on your turn. And, yeah, uh, prevent, let's say, a Reality Smasher from ending uh, the game. So I think here John's play is pretty locked in. I, I think it's Tron piece... Pass, mm -hmm. yeah. He if if Jacob like decides to ghost quarter a Tron piece, then you can use it to to crack the expedition map, get a land. Like, I, I think here that's I, I don't know if John has access to Tron piece. That might be I. It looks like he does, but it might be a redundant one. Uh, I think here just five mana go is totally reasonable. And then you get to untap Fractus, go back to a healthy ten. So you get to block a Reality Smasher going to eight. So so John has the tools to kind of stabilize. And Jacob stumbling on land that exact turn really gave John an out. Because if Jacob had drawn a land that turn, he would have been able... I, I said about pumping the Ballista, but he actually had Reality Smasher. He would have just won. So Jacob was a bit unlucky there to not draw the land. <laughs> yeah, there we go. There's the land now. Yeah, sad, the sad land. And the post-combat Reality Smasher... Never, oh, never what you want to be doing, but here we are. Yeah. And, he, you know, he knows it's lethal. He also knows about Thrag Tusk. Yeah, so John's play here, let's see. He drew a power plant, I believe, and that looks like Tron to me. Um, and at that point, he has access to 10 mana. And 10 is a really... He does have Tron That's a now. very powerful turn, since he can go for Fractus plus... Uh, something else that something else looks like ancient stirrings so something like ancient stirrings into fought here plus fra plus fractus would be really powerful this turn um essentially allowing john to see get the information on jacob's hand and, and buy some time um worm coil engine will also be very powerful here um yeah most likely though seeing what john saw on top the problem is he knows there's a ghost quarter in front so he can't really get anything like getting an ulamog here is actually really tough because he knows that his Tron can be broken up. So, and he can't cast Ulamog. He'll be, he would be one shy with this Tron piece. So it's actually a really difficult uh, choice. He can take the Ulamog for the future or he can decide, I want to take a redundant Tron piece. But then you give the information to Jacob, so it's actually a really rough uh, scenario here. I think the Ulamog is probably the highest equity play. Um, play the Fractusk and then uh, he has access to this member in hand. Um, so that would allow him to kill both Smashers going back to to four after he gains uh, back down to five and then to three so i think this is what's going to happen is john's going to play fractusk go to nine uh jacob's going to then play smasher attack john's going to block one smasher kill the other with this member going down to five then he takes two trample going down to three but jacob's tapped out no board uh and john has tron um and he has ulamog in hand now as well yeah but because of ulamog yeah, you can see John here, very heads-up play, gets rid of the Ghost Quarter now to give Jacob no chance to disrupt his plans. Jacob, so I really like this. Yeah, that was smart. Jacob, <laughs> he has a waste, so he's got <laughs> that covered, I guess. I mean, it is a basic land. 
The correct choice of uh, waste art, by the way. There are two. Indeed. Yeah. This one looks like a waste. The other one looks like a planes. But, wow, here the dismember. Ooh, interesting. So what this does is it doesn't deal more damage to John now uh, because there's still free toughness to block, but it means that the Reality Smasher would survive combat. So this second Smasher, if Jacob plays it, is pro Just I don't know if Jacob... I think he has two Endbringers in his hand, maybe? Yeah, maybe he doesn't have Smasher. Okay, he has yeah. two Endbringers? Yeah. I don't think he has another Smasher. Yeah, those look like Game Ringers. That's a good spot. Yeah. Uh, yeah, here, John decided to just kill the Reality Smasher. It's going to deal damage anyway, so might as well do this. Yeah, he gets to keep his beast. Yeah, he also has access to Ulamog, so whatever Jacob decides to run out here, he can get rid of. And it's going to be an Endbringer, but that's not long for this world because John Stern gets to untap with Tron. Oh, boy, he finds another mine as well. And yeah. here he is again. This is the same thing. Eduardo, you set this up from before the match even started. You said that the mm -hmm. Mono Green Tron had the ability to simply go over the top of Eldrazi Tron. And while we did see Eldrazi Tron apply some pressure and some disruption, John has both games been able to play Ulamog the Ceaseless Hunger and just simply outpace Jacob. I mean, Jacob just doesn't have anything to do here. Yeah, It's just too big. Yeah, it's a 10-10, no answer, and just the attack's going to be enough. There yeah, we go. and that's going to do it. Jacob Nagra has to extend the hand to John Stern, who picks up the match two games to zero, and he kind of made it look easy, to be honest. J Jacob wishes he drew that cavern one turn earlier because that would have been game win. Just being able to cast the, play the smasher and deal lethal damage. Just drew that land a little too late. Yeah, that's what he's thinking right now. You can take a look at the screen there. But John Stern with the victory. He's going to move on to 5-0, and oh, so a solid start. Although, I have to say, we're kind of used to that from John Stern. <laughs> uh, he just runs it up. You know, he's a type of player, and there's a group of players like this that play a lot of GPs, and they're always in the running. You know, it's yeah. just so common on day two to see John Stern near the top tables, you know, maybe one loss away from a top eight or maybe in the top eight, like depending on how things go for him. But he's a consistent performer. Yeah, and always he, he always thinks he works hard, so he always comes up with what I feel is a very good list for the tournament. We saw him in Toronto uh, lose in the end to Bogles, but like had a chance because he played in Snaring Bridge in a burn deck. Really good spot on innovation for that tournament. This time, I really like his sideboard plan with the Mono Green deck. I know like Fractusk and Fodnots here are relatively common, but I like that he decided to go for that approach. The double life from the loam is also really heads up against all these Fulminator Mage Jun based decks. So he he is, he understands what's going on. All right. Well, let's talk to him because he's down in the feature match area right now. John Stern, hello, my friend. Marshall Sutcliffe with Eduardo Suchgullick in the booth. Nice little victory there. Yeah. Hi, guys. Hey. Um, so we wanted to talk to you about your choice to play Mono Green Tron here. Did you consider any other flavors of Tron coming in? Uh, yeah, I started with the Black Green deck. Um, I just wanted to be able to... I was having some trouble with the Field of Ruin decks. Mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to be able to get more basics. Um, mm -hmm. And the black cards are good, but I felt like the green card, the green deck still had some solutions for the problem. So uh, Walking Ballista in particular was very good for me. Nice. Yep. Uh, you, you, you were talking just a minute ago, Eduardo, about some of the sideboard choices that he, he's brought. Yeah, and I wanted to like uh, double on that. Like In that match that we saw the Ghost Quarter, your choice of playing Mono Green Tron was spot on because you had that third basic. That was like right on. Mm -hmm. But yeah, like for the sideboard card, like I think Fodnot Seer and Fractusk are common in the Mono Green deck because you want to like morph into more mid-range against these Field of Ruin decks. Yep. Um, talk to me about like the choice to run the two life from the Loams. Um, okay, so I, I wanted... I was. Actually, I was having trouble with, uh, with Jun decks when I started testing Tron, which is not really what I expected. Um, but the Fulminators and Bloodbraid keeping, like, threatening Karn um, was a problem. So, and I found they could just keep me on a low land count. Um, sure. So I wanted some way, if they start Fulminator, you know, if they cast Fulminator Mage, I want to still be able to hit land drops. Sure. I was trying Crucible, but they have natural answers to that. Yes. And also to Pithing Needle, uh, they just have their Cold Guns Commander, whatever, that's still good against me. Sure. Mm -hmm. So Life from the Loam was like, uh, it, you know, I can cast it on two if they take my third land and, you know, get right back in the game. Yeah. <laughs> the, the long way to Tron, right? Yeah. I'll dredge my Loam. Ah, I hit a Tron piece. Let's do it. <laughs> well, actually, in those matchups, because of the way I'm boarding, I really just want to hit land drops. Yeah. It's okay if I don't have Tron for a while, as long as I'm not sure. stuck on two, three lands. 
Uh, what about this matchup against Jacob here? Mm -hmm. uh, game one, it looked pretty straightforward for you. Game two, he was able to apply a little bit more pressure, but still, your late game just seemed to dominate. Well, I mean, I got a little lucky. Like, he, uh, he had the second thought knot for my Oblivion Stone, and I drew another one right off the top. Yeah, so. that was nice. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I guess uh, the, the, the Eldrazi decks that are playing Obligator are a little bit more of a problem because they can just punish me. You know, w when I cast that Ulamog, I could just be dead. Um, sure. Right. But, uh, yeah, so it's, you know, as long as I don't, you know, get overrun, it's a pretty good matchup. Now, we had some recent unbannings in Modern, Blood Red Elf and Jace the Mind Sculptor. You're not playing those cards. Were, were you tempted? Did you try anything out with those uh, cards um, in them? Yeah, I mean, the first thing I, like, I pl I've played Jun before mm -hmm. uh, a lot with Blood Red. you played a lot of decks before. You have a <laughs> wide range. Yeah, I like to mix it up in Modern. Uh, it's what makes the format fun for me. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I did, like, I actually top uh GP Toronto with uh, Blood Red Jund. Um, yeah. So yeah, I def that was the first thing I tried, but I was having, maybe it's because the metagame hadn't settled yet and there was like Jace decks, there was all these different decks that were good against Jace decks. Um, I was, you know, I was going 3-2 in my leagues and I just, it just didn't feel like I wanted to play that deck. Um, sure. And I, I naturally, like I tried Hollow One as well. I tried a bunch of decks and at some point I was like, okay, I need to make a decision and just work on a deck. I thought Burn was pretty badly positioned with, uh, with uh, Boggles, you know, doing well and being played in the mocks a lot. So I didn't really want to play that. Sure. Um, so yeah, I, I just went to Tron. Nice. Well, great job. Great start for you. 5-0 and to kick things off. John, thanks so much for taking the time. Yeah, no problem. We'll see you. Yeah, thanks. Great stuff. And uh, boy, you nailed that one. <laughs> he, he, you talked about life in the loam for Fulminator and the yeah. first words out of his <laughs> mouth for Fulminator. I'm like, nice work, Eduardo. I this try. That's why I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we call him the expert, you know. All right, we've got a short break to take. When we come back, though, we'll have Time Walk Magic here for Phoenix. Don't you go anywhere.
here at GP Phoenix. That's Eduardo Sajgalic. I'm Marshall Sutcliffe. Thanks so much for coming along for Modern here. We've got Bloodbraid Elves. We've got Jaces. We've got a whole bunch of different archetypes to show you. And down in the future match area, Eduardo, we've got our Time Walk match, which is taking turns versus Lantern Control. Let's head on down. So this was recorded just a little bit ago, but they're actually still playing to the surprise of not us, <laughs> since this is a pretty slow matchup potentially. Daniel Wong on taking turns. It's Quad Sleeve Guy. He's back. I remember this uh, this deck from GP Las Vegas last summer. He's four <laughs> sleeves on each of these cards. It, the deck stands, like, really tall. It's hard to shuffle. Sam Black on the other side. Of course, everybody knows who Sam Black is. Sam is on Lantern, and Daniel's the one who's on taking turns, as you can see here from his hand with Time Warp in it. So I said that this is a potentially very slow matchup. Why did I say that? Well, one deck tries to, <laughs> one deck is trying to deck the other, and the other one is trying to take all the turns. <laughs> so yeah, um, this, however, seems like so. So, to the surprise of maybe no one listening, I am not a full-on expert on the lantern versus taking turns matchup. All right, we need somebody else in the booth. Can somebody come in <laughs> here who actually knows what they're talking about? <laughs> sure, but but at best guess here, I didn't I'm, find anybody. We're stuck with you, Eduardo. That's fair, but yeah, <laughs> at best guess, I would say that uh, Daniel's favorite. Okay, um, and the reason for that is that Daniel has access to a few cards that are very troublesome for Sam. Uh, Jay's the Mining Sculptor can be answered with a needle, uh, Pivy Needle, but mm -hmm. without that card, just runs away with the game. Sam won't have the ability to really lock Daniel out. Um, the Mika Core that you can see in Daniel's hand is instant speed card draw. I see. And that, yeah. He can use that to get the card that Sam's trying to mill away from the top of his library. Right, exactly. Or, like, when there's an important card. He can fight over a Codex Shredder. Right. So so here, it's it's quite difficult as well. Sam also has a few dead cards main deck. Something like Ensnaring Bridge is, I mean, okay against part of the Water Veil, but Daniel doesn't need that card. He can just go to Jace the Mind Sculptor and uh, minus 12, bye-bye. Now, when I've watched the Taking Turns deck play, there's a few different ways it can win. Jace the Mind Sculptor ultimates one of them. But some of them also run part the Water Veil and try to just kill you. Is that viable here? Now, we know that Sam Black has Insaring Bridge, but there's also these cards that force you to draw a whole bunch of extra cards kind of against your will. I is that even a, a thing? Like, how does the game end if Daniel wins it? Um, if the, g the game ends with Daniel having taken his sixth or seventh turn in a row and eventually just attacking for lethal. But c can he if there's a, a bridge down? Well, essentially, with Miko Koro, you force Sam to draw cards, and your six six is you, fine you to can attack through. Get it, no problem. Yeah, yeah there's not really an issue. But yeah, here Daniel correctly slamming down Jace at the first available opportunity, and also brainstorming correctly at the first available opportunity. Yeah. <laughs> look how big the cards look. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, that deck I saw in real life in Vegas. It's tall. It is really tall. It's funny when he shuffles it because it's kind of a. <laughs> he's got to kind of move it around and then line them up it's it's pretty good ever played battle of wits <laughs> uh i have not no i i have it have was, you uh, it's the only time i've seen spectators help for a search effect <laughs> <laughs> here you look through this chunk of my library that is actually what happened That's it was great. a pretty funny tournament um but yeah here thought sees now from sam black is gonna see some stuff what do we see there exhaustion there's a cryptic command a pair of time warps wow i see much that, that's I a see real hand yeah i see a lot of bad news for sam no kidding he's going to take one of the time warps but daniel can fire off one of those or an exhaustion if sam taps out yeah so so here time warp is the time card taken because essentially cryptic command is probably worse for sam in a vacuum but uh because of jace time warp also gets a free brainstorm in so that's why sam takes the um yeah. Takes, takes one of the two. Yeah. yeah, but this Temporal Mastery, oh my gosh, Jace making Temporal Mastery Miracle. This is going to be horrible for Sam. Yeah, we're doing <laughs> it now. That is awesome. Temporal Mastery, so actual time walk here for Daniel Wong. Just two mana. But like you said, every turn that goes by that he gets to do this, Jace is constantly adding huge advantage. Yes. Yeah. The, the interesting thing is Daniel probably had to think about his Miko Koro sequencing with Jace uh, and decided, I want to Jace first and then Miko Koro. 
Um, so I guess he values not being uh, brainstorm locked more than trying to dig one card deeper for another temporal mastery. Uh, it doesn't look like much, uh, but th these like little details can be important when you're trying to lock away games that are won. Oh yeah, the fetch land Jace is just the best. Unreal, it's the best feeling. Yeah. Th I'm already starting the little clock on Sam Black. How much more can you take, Sam? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, uh, there's a few more turns worth of watching your opponent brainstorm and you know take turn after turn after turn before you eventually go okay, 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 okay. You know what this is? Poetic <laughs> justice. <laughs> Why is that? Because he's lantern a lantern pl player. <laughs> the lantern player is watching helplessly as their oh, opponent takes. Oh, that is great. Small, uh, small incremental actions that look not like not much, but just make your life miserable. That is really funny. <laughs> this All is right, there it is another time warp. Yeah. Just take how how often do you think you're going to say that? There is another time warp. Yeah. I mean, this is why it's time walk magic, right? Absolutely. Yeah, we're <laughs> in time walk magic <laughs> supreme here. Great <laughs> point, Eduardo. Oh, yeah, this is so difficult for Sam to get out from because basically Daniel's just seen enough cards per turn that he can likely just chain together extra turn effects indefinitely at this point. Yeah, <laughs> temporal mastery in hand. Yeah, he's not even bothering to put it on top of his library. He could just cast it. He's going to just cast it. Yeah. Whee! And, and that makes sense if it's the last time walk effect. And also, Sam still has access to one Codex Shredder activation. So uh, if, Sam had if Daniel had decided to put the temporal mastery on top for next turn, Sam could have decided, okay, this is probably dangerous. I'm going to Codex Shredder away the card if I believe it's temporal mastery. But yeah, Daniel just chaining... These time walk effects, basically every turn, an extra looking at more cards with the Brainstorm, making extra land drops. Even if Daniel doesn't go for infinite turns now, he's going to be so far ahead just because of all these extra land drops and all these extra Brainstorm activations. Curious if he ends up playing in any of his Howling Mind, eff Howling Mind effects on, you know, he's got a few of them. He, he has the Howling Mind you can see on the top of his library and the Dictative Crucifix somewhere in there as well. D does he just run those out at some point? Like how, you know, he seems to be just be using Jace for this. Yeah. You, you now there it is. Yeah, you you're, right about the, you're right about the running it out. And the main reason for that is that um, he has, a, it's actually surprising that Daniel decided not to play Exhaustion. But I Are we going to see Giga Drows? Yeah, that's what's going to happen is um, Daniel values the, the use of his Giga Drows here uh, rather than trying to um, go for essentially the exhaustion here. He'd rather, like... We, we should mention this, by the way, because this isn't a, a deck we see on camera all the time. What does Giga Drows do, and why is he, oh. why is he doing it? When, when and why is he doing it? Sure. So Giga Drows is one blue top target permanent um, with an ability called Replicate. So when you cast it, you can play an, basically an extra blue mana to have the effect again. So essentially you can replicate and, and um, tap down as many permanents as you have blue mana. But yeah, the, the needle here on Jace, very key. So Daniel's going to play his one of Commandeer because that needle needs to go. <laughs> <laughs> wow, Daniel is doing it now. <laughs> um, we, we talked yesterday, right, about the reverse rule of uh, text. Uh -huh. If you're playing in an eternal format like Legacy or Modern, if the card is a card that you've never seen before or has too much text, um, it's probably not good news for you. <laughs> But yeah, here, yeah, the easy taking the needle and naming Codex Shredder so that the Jace keeps doing its thing. And yeah, the, Daniel should be, well, I mean, Daniel's extraordinarily favored this game. Oh yeah, he's smashing now. He has Sam Black tap down of all relevant permanents at this point. Yeah, he's got Brainstorm going. He's got the Howling Mind to fuel his hand. He just needs to start chaining together more and more. Yeah, time, time warp here. There we go. Time warp. That surely has to do it. Maybe he's got another uh, Howling Mind? No. Yeah. Card, card, brainstorm. Oh, my God. I am so jealous right now. <laughs> draw a card, draw a card, and then put three more cards. He's seen five cards off the top of his library. What in the world? It's great. Um, basically, there's a fetch land as well. Yeah, shuffle those fiddle pushes away. Um Basically, what Daniel's... By the way, you may be looking at this and say, how like does Daniel win? And here, mm -hmm. the answer is, at some point, he's going to Snapcaster, a Time Warp, or he's going to Awaken apart the Water Veil. And once that's done, uh, Daniel will get to attack. He'll essentially, even as the 6-6, six, six, as we mentioned earlier, Mika Koro can make Sam draw extra cards, and Sam has no mana. Yeah, so. There's also, of course, Crypto Command to just bounce in Snaring Bridge. And yeah. 
get in there for the two or three turns he'll need to actually win the game. Serum Visions. How plain. <laughs> he sees Dictator, Crufix, and something. Yeah, at this point, it's pretty easy. Daniel's just looking for time warpish effects. Nothing else really is. We have certainly control. reached the point of inevitability here, though, for Daniel, right? Yeah, because if Daniel, like, can't find another time uh, walk style effect or time warp style effect, he can just Giga Drow Sam's mana. Yeah. Um, or Exhaustion Sam. The, the options are pretty plentiful. Exhaustion here acts as a virtual. Uh, time warp. Yeah, it's pretty close. I mean, the Mox Opal does untap. Yeah. A little bit annoying. Yeah. But here's Giga Drowse again, which can, in fact, tap down all of the relevant mana sources here. One, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah. But, but this one's a lot closer because Sam drew a few cards from the Halley Mine. Um, so I wonder why not play the... The Exhaustion maybe would have been okay because you don't want Sam to be able to Whir of Invention. Mm. And Exhaustion prevents Sam from having enough uh, blue mana. Yeah, basically permanently. Yeah. I think Exhaustion doesn't uh, lets artifacts untap. I, I think it's... Um, it's creatures and lands. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. What, that's what I believe. So the, Sam would have ac had access to Mox Opal, which was probably Daniel's take on Giga Drowse. Um, yeah, so yeah. <laughs> Just get rid of those fatal pushes. Once again... Two cards for drawing, plus another three on the brainstorm from Jason. He's done this for seven turns, six turns in a row. <laughs> there we go. And there's that part, the water veil. Now, it can't attack yet. I think Sam's on four cards in hand right now. Yeah. So this so is. So he will have to be patient with that. Yeah. But as we said before, he can force him to draw with Mikakoro. Mikakoro says. Pay two mana, tap it. Both players draw a card. So he can just force cards into Sam Black's hand. Or he can just cryptic bounce it. He's got a lot of different ways. And look at look at the grip. <laughs> it's so large. Serum Visions. Ah, uh, there's a Snapcaster Mage. That's, oh, yeah. That's what the doctor ordered. That is what he wants. And that's part of the equation here. Sam Black just patiently awaiting his death. Uh, that's really all that you can say at this point. Yeah. Yeah. So he serum visioned first to get some scrying going and then activate a Jace. Yeah, it's it's better if you want to push away cards. Uh, because the serum visions draws a card, so no matter what, if you put cards on top of Jace, like you're you're basically only putting one you're you're only getting rid of one card with serum visions. Something funny is time was called on uh, the match the matches in the room. Um, trivia piece. Mm -hmm. um, if you have extra turns and you're playing the tagging turns deck, you can take all five of them. You can. <laughs> yes. Yes, that's right. It is just turns. It doesn't care who gets them. You're totally right. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. Yeah, here Daniel's hand is, I mean, I, I'm just going to assume Daniel wins this game. I'm not quite, I'm, I'm sure it happens. It's just a question of time. It's not even a question of turns. I think Daniel's pretty ahead on that. Yeah. So. I'm curious. Uh, you know, Sam also may be getting a little bit of information about how Daniel's going to win, if there's anything different than the usual list, that kind of thing. And you know, there's not a lot of downside. Not much Sam can do anyway. Yeah. The, the funny thing is the, the main difference is the, are these fatal pushes. He also plays multiple Giga Drowses, which Sam has already seen. But, yeah, the fatal pushes are the main uh, reason uh -oh. you run black mana. And plus those are, Yeah, and those are going to be taken out. Yeah, those are just completely dead. And there's Mikokoro to force Sam Black to draw some cards. Got to go to discard here, Daniel. Yeah. And Sam is just, you see his hand motions. He's like, yeah, yeah, do your thing. You got two Snapcasters now. I think Sam's up to four cards in hand, uh, five cards in hand potentially as well. So if he has five, then one more Miko Koro activation means that the floodgates are cleared yeah. for, the, uh, for that land to start attacking as well. Yeah, and that's going to do it. And there's a part, the Water Veil. This is all that was needed. Uh, Daniel essentially gets the extra turn of uh, attack, and this is already a two-turn clock with Mikokoro. Right. Um, so, yeah, this, this is going to end it. Uh, Sam essentially draws the card, uh, takes 10, next turn takes 10. So, so this is going to be it. Okay. We, we found an eventual line, and Sam sees it. Sam's dead. So Daniel Wong, quad sleeve guy. We're going to actually jump to game number three here. So this 
we're actually running short on time because, as you mentioned a second ago, Eduardo, uh, we're starting to get ramped up for the next round of live action here. So we're going to skip it. But as you may have surmised, Sam Black wins it. So maybe some sideboard tech. We don't know. But let's find out here in game number three if it's going to be Daniel Wong or Sam Black Yeah. in kind of a weird matchup. Yeah, here I like Sam boarding in... Uh, even the uh, Ooh, yeah, nice. crumble to dust as a kind of stone rain effect. Uh, even getting Miku Core is pretty nice, although you can needle it. I like the collective brutality. I like the extra needle. I like the surgicals and the Tezzeret to deal damage. Um, I think Sam's going to morph a lot of his conditional cards, like Ensnaring Bridge, Abrupt Decay, in, um, and basic, uh, you know, maybe which main war can stay in, but yeah, basically just try to be a lot more on the front foot. You can see the Tezzeret in Sam's hand. Uh, Daniel Wong's going to basically lose the Fatal Pushes. And there's a few cards he's going to board in, but the one that you need to remember is Hercules Recall. Hercules Recall is pretty powerful against Lantern Control. Oh, yeah. Sets them back significantly. Also can open the door for a win, right? Like you can just Hercules Recall and set up a scenario where you just win. Yeah. Because yeah, the truth is, is that most of their artifacts are actually quite cheap. And even if you Hercules them, they can usually rebuild within a turn or two. But that window is wide open during that, that time frame. You can just kill them. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, Sam decided to board in as well the Maelstrom Pulse, probably as a way to, to get rid of Dictative Crew Fix, Howling Mine, sure. Jace the Mine Sculptor. Okay, Land go from Daniel Wong. Hasn't done a whole lot here. But, yeah. And the reason you see Daniel not doing a whole lot is because apart from a miracle, the temporal mastery, his early play, there's not that many early plays in the deck. Uh, there might be Howling Mine on turn two, but that's a pretty risky play. Um, Serum Visions. Here, the most likely thing is Daniel's going to end of turn Dictate of Crufix if he has that card in hand, uh, because he would have boarded out a lot of his early plays, which would have been for other matchups. Um, it's from turn four that the taking turn decks really start to shine. Uh, so Sam basically has the first couple of turns set up, and then uh, the fireworks get loose. Yeah, here. Yeah, Sam, Sam's head has a lot of power. The Whir, the Tezzeret, uh, the Pulse is an answer. Um, it just, he didn't even fire the um, Ancient Stirrings here, which tells me that he's probably going to cast the War of Invention, but it's going to be X equals two. So here, let's see, what's the best thing that Sam can get? He could Whir for X equals one. Um, that would get Sam access to uh, Lantern of Insight. Most likely here would be pretty good because of the Codex Shredder. Um, yeah, and we see a Lantern, uh, sorry, a War of Invention for one. So, so most likely we're going to see Lantern of Insight here. Lantern of Insight? Okay. Yeah. He wants to be proactive. Of course, Pithy Needle is another option that he can use against Jace the Mind Sculptor as it is such a big problem. But as you see, Lantern of Insight from Sam Black says... I'm starting to set up my lock here. I mean, Lantern plus two Codex Shredders is already a pain for Daniel. Yeah, that, this is how Sam uh, opens the window to winning the, the game. Um, essentially, being able to control Daniel's draw is important. It just depends. Now, basically, it's down to the cards in Daniel's hand because Sam has access to two Shredders plus a Lantern. So Daniel's going to is it's going to be hard for Daniel to stress um, these Codex Shredders, but it is possible. Uh, the Time Warp effects give you that that extra draw. Cryptic Command is also really difficult. And yeah, But yeah, because it's really difficult for Sam to kind of disrupt um, Daniel's draw, um, he, that's, this is why he like kind of does his own. Yeah, And here you see Collective Brutality trying to clear the way away from a Cryptic Command to dr because he doesn't want Daniel to draw that Jace mm. with Cryptic. So he's going to Collective Brutality here and make sure the way is clear. It's just a really good card here in general anyways, even if there's no Cryptic. And it, says, and it seems like there is not. So Daniel says, okay, yep, it's going to resolve. Yeah. yeah, as you can see. Yeah, he's got Commandeer plus the Jace that we see in hand, as well as the one on top of Library, plus a Time Warp and three lands. Yeah, as you can see, like, Daniel had the option to Commandeer, but that would have been losing two extremely powerful effects in Time Warp and Jace. So cor correctly, my view doesn't Commandeer here. Uh, Sam essentially here is going to take the time warp, but this Jace is going to be a problem. Um, but that said, uh, Daniel has one turn uh, of that Jace before Maelstrom Pulse hits. So 
here most likely Ooh. it's going to be um, get two lands and fetch them away. So the Jace will draw a lot of cards, which is really powerful. I think that's what we're going to see here. Obviously, Sam can't take the Jace because of Collective Brutality. But wow, okay, the Commandeer is interesting. That is uh, We took the Commandeer instead of the Time Warp. That's a really interesting line. Um, the thing is, Jace being played will make it more likely that Daniel has access to... Um, Blue cards. Yeah, so, so I think Sam is going for the power play of trying to take the Commandeer and hit the Miracle Needle. Uh, Sam having access to free needles with ancient stirrings, he probably felt this this was his highest chance to get there. So he just wanted to get hopefully a needle. Yeah, he ended up hitting uh, Pixis of Pandemonium instead, yeah. which he will now play. I think here you kind of have to lose the Jace. Even you just though have Dan to mill it. Daniel has an access to another one in hand. Maybe maybe, and and you have access to Maelstrom Pulse. So I'm not sure here, because you're going to have to pulse that Jace. You can't really count on having Needle with no search effects. Uh, I don't wow. believe there's one in the graveyard, uh, which would have been useful with that Academy Ruins. So yeah, here, this is looking... Yeah, so you get to see all the cards here because of Lantern of Inside and the way it works. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow, and that Chalice of the Void. Oh, is that what's in the middle there? Yes. Uh, is it too late? Um, it's a little late. Not gonna <laughs> that that's for sure. Uh, it would have been a really powerful turn two play here. Uh, Chalice is still okay. It gets rid of any top decked um, ancient stirrings, for example, or fought seizes. Uh, it's not the most relevant card, but it's definitely better than a lot of the the two lands that uh, Daniel drew as blanks. Not even fetch lands. Um, I think we do get to see the next card because the cards are drawn, so yep. they do go to hand. So yep. yeah. And he asked the judge, and the judge said the same. Yeah. Yeah, and here, play the fetch land and get rid of this nonsense. Ooh. He's actually thinking about just playing the basic. No, no, he went for it. Yeah. yeah. The, the, there are two cards you do not want to read. Right. <laughs> Seemed like a really good spot to shuffle those away. Yeah. In the meantime, Sam Black kind of priced into using Maelstrom Pulse here, but it's a little awkward because he doesn't know there's another one. Ah. Ooh, hoo, hoo, pithy needle. Where were you last turn? Yeah, so here... Yeah, so Sam's plan, rather than Pulse, was actually to, with the mana, to play the Tezzeret plus and hopefully get a Needle from that. So that's why you didn't see... Uh, Sam, like you, That's why you saw Sam take the Commandeer, so that he could resolve a Needle. So that was actually really heads-up play. That was, like, a lot of foresight from Sam. I'm, I was actually really impressed with the line he took there. Um, he decided he wants to, instead of milling Daniel... He decided, I want to make sure that you draw a dead card, and I'm going to take the risk of this needle. So he took the one turn. So Daniel Wan on NCEP is going to go ahead and crack that flooded strand, just grab one of those islands that he could see anyway, then shuffle that massive four-sleeved monstrosity of the deck that he has. And, and here, this is a weird game of magic. So in the question of who's ahead, um, Daniel still has some tools available. Uh, the Time Warp was the big one that we saw. Um, the Jace in his hand is virtually dead. The Chalice is now not very powerful. Essentially, it's not, as you said, it was too late. Mm -hmm. So the Chalice and the Jace are dead cards, and he has access to two lands. So I think Sam is pretty firmly ahead unless Daniel draws a glut of incredible cards. Um, that Gemstone Caverns is not what I call an incredible card at this point. But yeah, here... That Tezzeret um, Agent of Bolas is not something that Daniel wants to see Sam untap with, so he's kind of forced to play the Time Warp here. Um, not much value. Unfortunately, no Howling Mind, no Dictate. Yeah. Sam has to act here and not let him take another turn for only two mana and land land off the top here for Daniel. Not great. And there's that chalice, but like you said, a little bit late. Yeah. Plays the land and passes the turn back to Sam. This one feels like it's starting to go Sam Black's direction, though, doesn't it? Yeah, it definitely does, especially with that Whir of Invention. Uh, now Sam's lines are all focused around how could I lose this game and right. everything I can do to prevent that factor. Right. So essentially... Every play you're going to see Sam make is in the 
in the vein of how do I lo like how do I can I prevent myself from losing this game? Sam is far ahead in this, so that's essentially what Sam is very ahead. Yeah, and that is a skill, by the way, that you'll see at the professional player level, is the ability to uh, kind of have a slider on how much risk you're willing to take versus how far ahead you are, and the opposite of that. And that's where we're at here. Sam Black significantly ahead, so he's going to be very conservative with his plays versus taking on a lot of risk when you're behind, which is something that you find yourself needing to do. Yeah. It's fun to watch this actually play out in real time. Yeah. What's nice about the Tezred is it closes down the game quickly, which is mm -hmm. actually pretty appreciated. Um, the War of Invention doesn't really need to get anything specifically. There's no card that, uh, that in Sam's deck apart from maybe like another... Uh, needle or a shredder that would really be relevant here. So yeah, so if Sam here is going to let the Howling Mine, that's not too... It could be an issue earlier on, but right now it's not. It's too slow, and it's going to let Sam draw the cards, which is pretty powerful. Yeah, and here Sam going to just untap. You could draw the Surgical to prevent Snapcasters at top deck. Um, yeah, and here just minus Tezra at attack for 10, and then Daniel's going to be at free, and you're pretty much going to be done. You could also, like, just plus the Tezzeret this turn, which is probably more better. Yeah, plus, I think plus seems better here. Um, you put Daniel down to 8, so you still have the 5-5 five, five creature, uh, and you get to drain um, Daniel for lethal with the ultimate on Tezzeret Agent of Bolas. So, so the plus is better here for that reason. Sure. It's just, it, again, very marginal. I guess it's, like, changing 99.5% into 99.8%. Yeah. Like, yeah. Uh, uh -oh. So Mox Opal beat down. You know how it goes. Box Opal beat down. That's how we do things. Yep. Yeah. Sam's going to use Maelstrom Pulse just to kill Chalice of the Void this time. Yeah, essentially making sure that the Surgical Extraction is live. That, 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 that was Sam's line. Uh, the Surgical Extraction is also a shuffle effect. So if Daniel manages to string together an incredible series of draws, he can... Ooh! Oh, yeah, that's, that's a must get, must get rid Hercules of. Hercules Recall, that one's going to get exiled. Pithy Needle and another Chalice on top. That's a non-issue, and that's going to be the end of this match. Right, he can just let him draw that, and that's exactly what he does. Daniel's going to immediately replay. This is Chalice on one. Yeah. We're, ju we're just essentially waiting until Sam can <laughs> untap his permanence and point at his Tezzeret. This is pretty funny. You know, Sam Black t took the two cards or the, the Mox Opal that he turned into a creature with Tezzeret and sort of took it half out of the sleeves to mark it that way. Chat thinks he's just mind-gaming Daniel, <laughs> the quad-sleeve guy. Here, I'm the <laughs> half-sleeve half guy. <laughs> Talk you with this. <laughs> it's different approaches for sure. Yeah, next-level gaming from Sam Black. I think Sam like just plays incredibly crisp magic and likes to be extremely clear, and oh, that's what course. you see. Of course. I mean, it's just a joke. And that's going to do it. Ultimate on Tezzeret, Agent of Bullas is going to finish things off in Sam Black's favor. So Lantern 5-0 and in the hands of Sam with Daniel Wong on taking turns. He's going to pick up his first loss of the tournament, so he's going to have to put the suitcase or whatever he puts that <laughs> huge deck in and uh, truck onwards. We're going to do that here as well. But first, these messages.